Well, hi, folks. We are live. Welcome to episode 3302 of the Survival Podcast. This is called How Would You Design a Society from Scratch? I am gone this week for Exit and Build. Uh, I'll be leaving later in the week. Obviously, I'm here because this is live. I didn't want to, right after being on vacation for two weeks and doing two weeks of rewinds, have too many rewinds. So I came up with a compromise. Today's episode, I actually originally did uh, this exact same titled episode about five or six years ago. And I lifted most of the notes out of that. But I'm going to present it as I would present it today, not as I would have presented it back then. So I'll look up that original episode. I didn't have it in the show notes yet, but I'll add it to the audio notes. And if you ever, if, if you like for shits and giggles, if you want to go back and listen to the same topic from five or six years ago and see how it might have changed, that would be interesting. So here's what we're going to be talking about today. We're, we're going to be talking about how we would design a society from scratch. And this is something that I know about not, I, I hate when people say everybody, almost any time everybody uses that term. You know, everybody is into, everybody's excited about every, no, they're not. I don't care how many people are excited about a thing. Not everybody is, right? So I'm not going to say everybody would agree with this, but I think the vast majority of people, high 90 percentile, would agree no matter how they would answer the question, how would you design a society from scratch? They probably wouldn't do it the way that it's been done. There are things, like if you could go back to zero on society, just here in America, you probably wouldn't make it the way that it is now. You would try to learn from everything that was good, everything that was bad, and redesign and start from a whole new template. Yeah? And so that's what today's question, or that's what today's show is about. So, but I, I also want to kind of preface it with something that I think I did pretty well the last time I broached this subject. I will ask some questions today that are leading questions. They will be hard questions. They will make you think. When I ask them initially, you may feel like, well, he expects the answer to that question to be no, because it will sound like a leading question leading you to no. But for all you know, my opinion is yes. I think it's really important when we get into topics that are complex like this, that we start to think like designers or like program managers that are good at what they do. Not just they do that job, but they're actually good at what they do. So here's a couple analogies for this. When I went to Dave Jackie's uh, food forest workshop for the public food forest that we built in Helena, Montana, while we were doing our designs, and basically Dave would give us an assignment, we would design an element within the food forest. And we were in groups of about five or six people, and everybody has strong opinions, and everybody's stressing out. And I just happened to be in a group with a guy who was a professional landscape architect. He went to landscape architecture school. He had a degree in horticulture, really smart guy. And we're you know, using basically tracing paper, overlaying a printed map. And he said, do you know what you call this when you're, when you're working with like your design like this? And everybody looked at him. He said, you call it trash. You call it garbage. You don't get emotionally invested in anything. You just, whatever comes, you just draw it in. Then you look at it. You don't fight about it. You don't argue about it with yourself, with anybody else. It's a piece of paper. And when you write something on it, it didn't actually happen. And you have to let go of any emotional attachment so that you can just flow with every idea you have. And more than half of what you come up will be shit. That's what we call this trash. So that we can flow, so that we can find the right answer. So I, I dug that. I really like that. And I've tried to make that a part of what I teach as a designer, what I teach my grandkids when they're like, if they're doing an outline for an essay, like you don't worry about whether it's a good idea or not. You just throw it down and then you look at it and then you'll find pieces fit together. You'll throw some things out. You'll alter something. So that's how we're doing this today. We're just because we talk about a thing, just because we ask a question, just because we propose that the question might be answered with a yes doesn't mean that's what we're settling on so nobody can get emotional and have your panties all wadded up in a ball up your butt crack because jack said something that sounds not like what a real anarchist would say or whatever the bullshit you come on this is just spitballing ideas the other way to think about this is kind of the same thing when i was a marketer and i actually ran a company we did marketing for major brands and things like that we'd get a creative group together to go over like a marketing plan or if we were doing a product rollout, like to go over a product rollout. And then we would get everybody in a room. We get kind of give a speech I just gave in a different way and then say, okay, 
There's no dumb ideas. But the idea might be dumb. Let's all be adults. Nobody get wound up about being emotionally attached to their idea. And no matter what anybody says, and since I, I write like shit, I would get somebody to do it for me up on the whiteboard. Anything that anybody throws out, write it down as a bullet point. What if we did this? What if we did that? What if we did this? With an expectation that 90% of it, even from the smartest person in the room, if we're doing the exercise right, will be wrong. But we're looking for the 10%. So we have to throw everything at the board. That's how I'm going to try to do this today. Hopefully nobody will get their their grown-up panties in a wad about it and get upset when I ask a question like, does money make sense? Right? So only no one get upset about that. You know my answer to that's going to be, it absolutely does. But we need to examine that question. Maybe we'll learn something. All right. I'm also going to start off with what I call the hot dog test, which is probably the only thing that will be almost exactly the same as the last episode. Before we do that, let's go ahead and hear from our two sponsors of the day. Sponsor of the day, number one today, John Pugliano with the Wealth Steading Podcast. John will help you learn how to grow your wealth the way that you grow a garden. Slow, across time, following a proven system that cannot fail if you follow it properly. John has been investing for 38 years. He's a fantastic investment manager. He has a great podcast. It's short, comes out a couple, couple times a week generally. Uh, straight to the point, really keeps you informed. You can learn more about it where? At wealthsteading.com. And remember, John is not just an investment manager. He's also a prepper. He's part of this community. I met John the first time in 2011 at a prepper convention in Salt Lake City, Utah. He came up to me, told me he was just launching then his financial advisory business and going independent. And uh, he knew that I called them financial liars. And uh, that wasn't what he did. And I said, well, show me, bro. And uh, we just had a very brief conversation, and we've been working together one way or another ever since. He's also a member of the Expert Council. Uh, again, he's a prepper, a gardener, a homesteader, a ham radio operator. He's one of us, guys. Check him out today at wealthsteading.com. Next up, this is like your last, last, last chance to get in on the Exit and Build Land Summit 3 conference. What I want to kind of point out this week, I know unless you're local to Bastrop and you can make last minute arrangements or something, you're probably not buying tickets to get on a plane today. If you want to, great. Love to see you there. Uh, but it officially starts on uh, Thursday with a, with some farm tours that are off-site. The main conference, though, is Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And the, the Sunday's more like workshops with individuals, different tracks. The speakers are going to be Friday and Saturday. You can still get – now you can get one-day or two-day passes if you wanted to come just for that, if you're local. But no matter who you are, you can see most of the presentations live streaming video for free. All you got to do is fill out the form on the page. There's a link to learn more about Exit and Build in the video notes below. It'll be in the audio notes if you're not watching the video. And I'd really love to meet some of you guys and have you come out and hang out with us uh, while we're down there. So now let's dig into this topic. Let's try to keep those sponsor segments short, but also do the sponsors justice. Let's start off with... The hot dog test, right? And I've, I've used this to explain to people a lot of things. One is just why we prep. Because understanding where you would use violence on another person, especially if you're a very peaceful person that goes out of your way, that would initially answer this question. Would you ever use violence on peaceful people minding their own business, not harming you? And they immediately say no. Right. And I'm not even trying to trick you with what well, you're doing it by proxy if you endorse taxation because you are. I don't mean it that way. I mean, physical violence and not by proxy through the cops like you would go hurt this person. A lot of people would say no. And if I start building scenarios right about the time their kids are going to starve to death, all bets are off if they're an honest person, because I, I understand that. Um, so let's start with the hot dog test. You're kind of hungry. Yeah, you're kind of hungry and you don't have any money on you. You're on your way home. You're walking today. Your car's broke down. It's about a five mile walk. You're about a mile and a half into it. There's food at home, though. You're not going to die. You walk past a guy with a hot dog stand. Standing right next to the hot dog stand is a big fat kid. And when I say a fat kid, I mean like 
his stomach is touching his knees, that kind of fat. And he's shoving like one, he's got one hot dog in his hand, he's shoving another one in his face. And he's walking down the road. And you look at this guy and you go, you know what? I could just walk up to that guy, shove him on his ass, take one of his hot dogs and have food. Are you going to take his hot dog? Most common sense, decent people, even though the kid's kind of a, a fat ass, right? Doesn't really need it. It's still his hot dog. He bought it. Most people would answer that question if you're not a dick with, no, I wouldn't steal the kid's hot dog. Okay. Now you're homeless. Walking down the street. Hot dog kid has a box. Got half a dozen hot dogs in it. And he's walking and eating the seventh one. You're not going to eat tonight. Maybe tomorrow you'll get into the homeless shelter and get fed. But you're the one that's going hungry. There's no family members or anything like that. And, and you've been around a while and you've managed to always find enough to survive on. Are you still in fat kid's hot dog? Most decent people, even in that situation, would say no. You might go up to the fat kid and say, dude, I'm really hungry. Could I have a hot dog, please? And if he says no, then you respect that. And most people would pass that test. Okay. Now, the fat kid has a huge box of hot dogs with a rope around his neck so he doesn't drop them. And he's waddling his ass with both hands holding it while he's chewing. He's already inhaled one. You're homeless. There is no place that you can go like a shelter to get food. You've dug through the garbage can. You haven't eaten in three days. You're starting to worry that if I don't find some food, I could end up dead in starvation, severely malnourished. In fact, you are already malnourished. You stink. You can't find a place to take a bath. And you are really, really hungry. Your gut is growling. You can feel it. Somebody next to you can hear it. Do you steal the kid's hot dog? Believe it or not, there's a lot of people even in that situation that wouldn't do it. Let's paint you a different picture. Fat kid is driving a rascal scooter because fat kid is so fat, he can't even waddle his ass anymore. Fat kid is towing a little cart like you put on a, a lawnmower. It has boxes of hot dogs in it. At home, your two children haven't had a meal in three days. You know they're not going to eat tonight unless you act. You have no other way to acquire food. Will you take the fat kid's hot dogs? You probably will. And, and we have to start with this understanding that no matter how much we design a perfect society or try to design a perfect society, there will be things like that that will happen. No society. I heard somebody email me the other day. Socialism does work, Jack. You just got to go to national socialist countries. And I don't mean Nazis like, like Finland and Iceland. Nobody's hungry. Nobody. Bullshit. Bullshit. They might have less poverty. They might have less people hungry, but nobody has designed away all the problems of mankind. It's a myth and it's bullshit. And there's a different set of problems that come when you take 70% of somebody's income. I told this guy to move there and he's like, uh, they won't let me. Okay. Yeah. I bet if you really wanted to, if you really wanted to pay them 70% of your income for the rest of your life, you could find a way to live in Finland or Iceland or wherever the Scandinavian socialism works is. Right. Like no one has completely gotten rid of that. And so, especially people like myself, who are anarchists, and specifically would refer to myself as an anarcho-capitalist, that I believe in market-based solutions in the absence of coercion. I can't have that discussion. I can't present my ideology, and I can't do it in any genuine way whatsoever if I don't acknowledge that my system won't be perfect either. Okay, I can't. I, I mean, I can do it. There's, there's nothing like that prevents me from doing it but i shouldn't be taken seriously and so i want you to put i'll put it this way when i hear democratic socialists that support bernie sanders explain to me how everything would be perfect if we just had democratic socialism in america i don't take them seriously and i shouldn't because they clearly haven't thought, thought this through they haven't looked where it is they haven't examined whether people have done it they have no understanding of economics macro or micro they don't understand the difference between a country with 12 million people in it and a country with over 330 million people in it. They don't understand that there's been a country with closed borders and open borders. They don't understand the basic laws of supply and demand or inflation. So I can't take you seriously because your statement is not a serious statement. You may mean it seriously, but it can't be taken seriously by anybody with a, with a, with a freaking fifth grade education on economics. 
and most people that have a fifth grade education don't have a fifth grade econ uh, economics education. And so if I do the same thing, like if we just did everything we perfect, no, we're not looking for perfect. We're looking for better. We're looking for better. And better is a subjective term. So let's start with why do we even have a state? This isn't Jack bashing the state. This is a sincere question. How do we, as humans, justify the existence of a state which oversees our lives and tells us what we can, what we can't do, and how we have to do the things that we're allowed to do in the right way? And if we disobey this entity that is an unnatural entity through coercion, that we can be fined or put in a cage or even killed, legal. How do we justify that? If you really think about it, let's imagine we live in a society. There was no utopian Native American society like you've been told. But let's say that it was that utopian, right? That we had this society that was kind of tribal in nature. People saw their own things. Everybody had their own little collective villages and stuff like that. If you didn't like it there, you left and saw if anybody else would have you. If not, you went off and lived alone. As long as you didn't bother anybody, everybody left you alone. There was enough basic resources that people in general didn't starve, at least if they made any effort not to. And we didn't have a state. How would you tell people living like that? We, I got an idea. <laughs> we should all elect a group of people and give them authority over us. And give them power that none of us individually or even collectively have. But yet we're assigning it to them by vote. How would you justify that? And is you know, I find that if you challenge yourself, a lot of times when you think you have a hundred reasons, you have two or three. And if you challenge yourself, you can drill down to those two or three. Here's what I've got. Protection. Protection in general. So protection from an outside force protection from a bad person within so protection of property protection of your body protection for your children protection for your neighbor some level of it's you know somebody can still come kill one of us but there's a deterrent and there's a recourse if it happens that would be one okay another would be stability one of the things that i can say about Every form of government out there, it provides some level of stability. Now, some provides more stability than others. In general, a government like the United States, where power is dispersed through the government, is more stable than a dictatorship, even if the dictators are, let's say, benevolent dictators. Because the dictator can change his mind today and change everything quickly. That's not stable. That's not even whether it's good or bad. It's just not stable. It's not predictable. And if a dictator dies or leaves office voluntarily, you could have a dictatorship as a structure that's democratic. You could have a democratic dictatorship, basically one central authoritarian executive with massive power. They could even be limited in how long they can serve in office. Let's say you had a United States president that functionally had the power of a dictator but they still had a two-term limit. Still a dictator. It's also less stable than a dictator that's in place for 40 years. It might be better, but it's less stable because the new boss just has new ideas and just starts changing everything like executive orders. But imagine if they had so much more power. So governments in of themselves create some level of stability. If you, if you come to the United States, you have a certain expectation of what it takes to do business. And then within each state, that changes, but it's relatively stable within the state. So we, we make the deal. We'll have government. We'll have somebody's face on our money. We'll have a central authority that prints money. We'll have a central authority that creates laws, that has the power of enforcement, the power of taxation. We make this deal primarily for protection and stability. The other one that gets invoked all the time, and I really think you can just put it down to protection and stability, though, is the collective good. The collective good, the good of society, right? Like bridges benefit everybody. The guy that drives over the bridge gets a benefit. The guy that never goes over the bridge but buys something that came over the bridge gets a benefit. The guy that had a job building the bridge gets a benefit. The guy that has a job maintaining the bridge has a benefit. Like when we look at when, when the, the whole Marauds objection, I mock 
But I do not deny the utility and benefit ratio of roads to society. There might be other ways to do it, but roads and bridges are one of the most collectively beneficial things that governments do. It, they really are. Now, I, feel, I still think you can put that under protection and stability. Without a reliable means to transport goods, services, and humans, you're not going to have stability. And there's a certain amount of protection that exists in having an infrastructure in place where people that would help you can get to you and people that you can get help from, you can get to, and people that you would help, you can get, like you see how that works, and access to food and access to supplies and all that infrastructure. So I think we can just say the main reason or the only real two reasons we make this bargain with Satan, which the state is, in my opinion, is for protection and stability. So then who gets protected is really important. And right now we have a government, I feel, that does a hell of a lot to protect the elite and a hell of a lot to protect any class that in their estimation they deem as being useful at the time and protecting that class and a pretty shitty job of protecting the thing that should be protected the most under a just system of government, individual rights. You say you care about the minorities? Cool. Tell me a minority smaller than one. If you protect the individual right, you don't have to protect individual class rights. Like, oh, we have to protect trans rights or women's rights or black rights or white rights. If you actually meant what you said and you said you want to protect the rights of individual freedom, then you don't need to worry about anybody's protected class. And you don't need to keep fabricating and creating protected classes to divide people. So protection, stability, that's why we made the deal. So if we're proposing an alternative society, we need one that provides protection of individual rights from bad actors or invading forces. And we need one that creates a stable environment where we can be pretty sure what tomorrow will look like outside of like, you know, random events. Like you can't say there won't be a tornado in Texas or you can't say there won't be a blizzard in a northern state in the wintertime. Like those are things that are natural forces. But the general way society works, what you're expected to do, what people can expect from you, what you can require of others, you need stability or you do not have a society. There's a there's a thousand plus ways to get there, but you need that. With that, let's start asking some serious questions. And remember, when I ask this question, if you're like, well, hell yeah, it does or hell no, we don't. And you think because I asked the question, I'm taking the opposite side. Stop it. Please stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Just don't be afraid to examine the question and see what comes out of it. We are, this is garbage. This is, I have somebody with better handwriting than me standing up on a giant whiteboard that fills a whole wall like I used to in board meetings. And we are spitballing. We're asking these questions and coming up with answers and everything goes on the board. And then we're going to cleanse that shit eventually. So don't get wrapped up in this. Because my first question is, does money really make sense? And boy, is there a lot of ways to take that question. Does money make sense as in there should be a monetary unit that we use for exchange of value? It's one way to take it. And I think most of us, me in particular, would say yes. Okay, let me ask it a different way. Does our money make sense? The money we have right now, the United, the United States dollar, does it make sense? If you were designing a society, would you design a United States dollar that works as the current one does? Where every dollar is a certificate for debt that must be repaid plus interest. And the only way to get the interest to pay on the debt is to print more money, which creates more debt. Would you design it that way? Most of you just said no, at least in your head. Good. If you said yes, I don't think this is for you. You're welcome here. I just don't think you're going to like where we go from here. I really don't. Um, you're probably uh, benefited uh, highly by what's known as the Cantillon effect. See, if you have a fiat-based monetary system, and that's not really what we have. We really have a debt-based monetary system by fiat is another way to look at it. It's a much more accurate way to describe it. Then the people who are closest to the faucet that can purchase the money by assuming debt at the lowest cost, can resell their debt to somebody else. We call those people bankers. 
But then you have elites who are not bankers that are bank adjacent. They can also get money cheaper than the non-elites, even if they both have the same credit rating. And so we have what you would call cantillionaires. You know, millionaires, billionaires, trillion. cantillionaires mean you can get as much money as you want forever. And you can do it in such a way that the debt repays itself and you have no income and you never run out of money. There's a lot of very wealthy people that run that game with real estate and it can go wrong. But if it's structured right and becomes broad enough, it really can't. That's just one way to leverage that, though. Another way is owning dozens of large businesses. And if two of them go bankrupt a year, you still don't care. You still liquidate, extract, and dump the capital into other concerns. That's Donald Trump's business model, by the way, which he's combined with real estate. Right? So if you are a quintillionaire, if you are benefiting from the current system, you're going to defend that system, even if you know it's unjust. But is it just Tom's here? God takes care of all our web stuff at TSP. Tom L. in the in the uh, comments or the uh, live stream, if you uh, ever want to know who I'm talking about when I say Tom, it's that Tom right there on the screen. And uh, let's say Tom needs to buy a house and Tom goes to the bank and Tom signs a piece of paper. But what that piece of paper says is that Tom agrees to give the bank, he's borrowing $300,000. And that, that piece of paper says he agrees over 30 years in return for $300,000 to give the bank $650,000 back. In of itself, even with a low interest rate, 30-year mortgage, it adds up. It's going to cost a certain amount to buy a house if you don't have the cash and you have to use somebody else's capital. So far, maybe I don't really like the way the numbers work out, but I don't necessarily see anything that doesn't make sense until you know that when Tom makes that promise, the bank does not have the $300,000. They never did have the $300,000. And they're able to make a general entry that creates $300,000 and deposit it into account for Tom for about an hour between the time his closing opens and his closing closes when he buys the house. Now, all of a sudden, you're like, well, wait a minute. This monetary, does this money doesn't make sense. So when we say, does money even make sense? There's a lot of ways to look at. It. Does any modern country's monetary system and how they create money make sense? Well, since they all work the way I just said, if you said that doesn't make sense, that's not good for sight. That's not what you would design. Then the answer is no, none of them do. I don't know of a country on a hard money policy, even the ones that have like El Salvador adopted Bitcoin as a national currency, but they also still use the dollar. So I don't know of one that makes sense. That's how the banking system works in El Salvador. It's how it works in Russia. It's how it works in Costa Rica. It's how it works in the United States. It's how it works in the EU. It's how it works in the UK. It's how it works in Australia. It's how it works in New Zealand. They all do it. It's all fractional reserve. So money to me, as we need something to quantify value, to act as a ledger, to be a store of energy and value so that we can have exchange, money makes sense. The money we have doesn't. So whether you're with me on my Bitcoin thoughts or not, what we both agree on is we would redesign the monetary system. And then we, there's a lot of redesigning of the economy that happens as immediately as you change the money. This is a keystone element in design, right? If, you, if you're if you saying, I'm going to design a house, and then you realize that the foundation is shaped in a way that's not going to work for you, and you change the foundation shape and dimensions, you redesign the whole house. You have to, right? Because... The, the, the foundation, its shape, its space, its area has all changed. You change the money, you drastically redesign the economy from the ground up, which means what? When we went off of hard money, the same thing happened. And if you go back and you look at worker productivity versus wage earned on average, everything went to shit in 1971. Just Google what happened in 1971 and pull on that thread a while. Next up, should people even have to work? Should people have to work? I know that you're like most of you anyway. Yes, you should have to work. Why? 
if I can say you have to work, if you can say somebody else has to work, does that mean that they no longer control their own labor? They no longer have a choice? Now, I didn't say should people have to work, and if you say no, they shouldn't, then that means everything should be provided to them, did I? I didn't say that. See, Tom's thinking. I like thinking. I like, he says, so long as they feed themselves, right? And then, but right before that, he said something, and we'll just jump to it then, because my next question, Tom, are you sneaking into the backside of TSP and reading the outline? Huh? Because you got it pretty good, Tom. And he would have access to that, but I don't think he did. The next question is, what is work anyway? What is work? When I said, should people have to work, did the first thing you came up with in your head be, should people need a job? He says he's not doing it. I didn't think he was. Right. A job. When I say, should people have to work, you probably thought, well, unless they own a business, that means they would have a job. But what is work? If I live in the middle of the wilderness, even with a small band, we, we go back to living like uh, like primitive man. Now, I don't mean you did. I mean like me and like 12 other people. We all hook up and we head out into the... Because the, if you want to know where I would do this in the United States, southeast, southeastern United States swamplands. I will never be hungry and I will never be for a lack of resources. I could live. You could drop me off somewhere in the swamps. You could come back. I'll get fat, just to be honest. But we, we go out in the swamps. It is public land or even, but no one even knows we're there. We've disappeared. We build ourselves some shacks like Native Americans in South America, some long houses or whatever. Doesn't really need much upkeep once we get it built. And, you know, we, we live on crayfish and frogs and catfish and whatever nature provides. Maybe we even have a little guard or something. We have no money. And sometimes we, do a lot of stuff really fast, and sometimes we lay around for weeks and don't do shit. Do we work? Depends on how you define work, doesn't it? We're not employed, but we work. Let's let's bring it a little closer to home. Let's say Crafty Master, right? Crafty Master says, would you object to banking if it was not fractional? I answer that later. Please, anybody that's asking questions, do so in all caps. When I'm by myself... It's hard for me to keep up with your questions. If they're all caps, I just see all caps and hit star, and I worry about it later if it wasn't really a question. right? But So Crafty Master is uh, on the dole. I know you're not, dude. We're just using – we're picking on you because you're here and available. He's on the dole. He gets welfare. He lives in a housing project, and he gets food stamps. He has free Medicaid. He has no income whatsoever except the little government stipend check he gets every week or every 1st and 15th. I don't care how he got there. I don't care if he just gamed the system. I don't care if he's on disability. I don't care what it is. He lives in the projects. He pays no money. If he pays money, it's like a token 25 bucks a month, and it comes out of the money the government gives him anyway. He's the government employee that says he's helping by paying taxes too, but when everybody's pushing the pickup truck, he's standing in the bed of the pickup truck pushing the cap, right? That's who he is as far as an income flow, okay? Does he work? You might be tempted to say, no, let's keep going with this. But let's say Crafty is actually, right, right, um, let's say that he is Crafty, and let's say that he actually feels bad about this whole situation. He actually feels like, I really don't want to take this money, but one way or another, he feels like this is his only option. Like, if he, if he, if he goes out and gets a job, it will never be enough to pay for his bills, whether he's right or wrong, it's how he feels. And he'll, he knows as soon as he has any income, they'll take away everything he has. So he's afraid to lose it, but he feels guilty. So Crafty decides, I will be the unofficial maintenance man for the projects I live in. He goes around every day and picks up garbage. He fixes, like if a neighbor has something wrong, he's kind of a crafty person. So, you know, instead of like waiting a week while the food stinks for the government to come fix the refrigerator, if it's something that can be done... Crafty goes, he has no money for this, but if you need a part, you got to buy your own part. But basically, he acts like the maintenance man of the projects. Some weeks he might put in 30 or 40 hours because there's a lot to be done. Then he might go three weeks of not doing nothing but looking out the window and going, everything's fine. Does he work? Does he work? Does he have a job? Is he employed? But does he work? So, should people have to work? And what 
is work? What does it mean to work? If people didn't have to work in the way we conventionally think about it, as in exchange my time for money, an hourly job, a salary job, what would they do? The answer is there's a million answers to that question. I ask you that, though. What if you didn't have to work? I didn't say you didn't work. You don't have to work. Let's say that Jack Spirico came into some money. I don't know. Some elitist decided they wanted Jack Spirico to stop talking and said, I'll give you $100 million to shut up, Jack. And Jack said, go piss off. And they said, we'll give you $1 billion right now to stop doing the survival podcast. I'll be honest. Every man has his price, a billion dollars. Yeah. So I set up my own little thing. It's not a podcast. I'm not cheating, but I'm still doing what I do and agitating. But I also say with a billion dollars, I'm going to give away $10 million a year to one person for the rest of my life. And you happen to be young guns here, young guns. You happen to be who I select this year. I send you a check for $10 million. Okay. You're not Elon Musk baller level, $10 million. You could go the rest of your life, never work again. You could have cash flow of probably about a half a million dollars a year and never run out of money. Even if you're 20 years old, you don't have to work. Well, what would you do? Now, if I ask young guns that, and then I ask John Rice, who's also here that I'm going to get to very different answers. And what it, what it really shows us is people would explore the things that they find the most interesting to them. If we didn't have to have jobs. How much work that people do is really useful and important. I'll describe something I read recently by a person who worked at an office. They had a job, been at the same job for 12 years, if I remember the article right. And she was talking about how a lot of what she does is not really important, even though she works hard. And it was on the virtues of doing a good job, no matter what. So this is not a person with a bad work ethic. But one of the things she pointed out is her company had a monthly newsletter, okay? And different department heads would submit, you know, pieces for the newsletter. And one of her jobs was to format every month the newsletter. So every, so because, you know, you tell everybody use font XYZ and they don't, you know, or, or you know, you, you read it and go, this guy's an engineer. It's written fine, but he doesn't know what a paragraph is. So you have to go through all this stuff, make it fit. Just so, and she makes the newsletter every month. She's like, nobody reads the freaking newsletter. Some people in some suits that sit around some tables a few times a month think it's important that there's a company newsletter, so I make it. But nobody cares. Nobody reads it. Nobody knows anything about it. Probably the guy that wrote the article doesn't even read his own article when the newsletter comes out. This is completely fine. How much is there like that? How many jobs have a whole bunch of shit in it that doesn't matter? It doesn't matter. It's meaningless. And if you didn't have to do those things to keep your job, you wouldn't. I'll tell you, I had, I had a job one time, and I just determined that a lot of the things that I was supposed to do weren't really necessary for the job. I didn't ask. I just stopped doing them. There were meetings that I was supposed to go to because I was part of the marketing department. I just didn't go. If nobody said anything, I kept not doing it. And all of a sudden, I became very, very productive for the short time that job lasted because it's one of the companies that got by, bought out by another one. And nobody ever bothered me, which meant all these things that they were asking me to do, that they were paying me to do, that they had every right to ask me to do were pointless. And by not doing them and keeping my mouth shut about not doing them, people were like, I guess Jack's not coming to this meeting. And that went from Jack's not coming to this meeting to Jack doesn't have to come to meetings. No one ever said it. It just became the thing. How much of that is there? And how many places, if you try to do what I did, you won't get away with it. You'll lose your job. You get written up. You get in trouble. So you do it. How many people could get away with it, but they don't think they can, so they don't try? How many people do try and get away with it? So how much... How much of a job is meaningful work? And I don't mean you feel emotionally fulfilled. You feel like you're fighting global climate warming change wokeness or whatever. Right? I don't care. I'm saying that the company's operations, you're doing a thing that are significantly important to the operational mission of the company. How many people have 20, 30, or 40% or more 
of the task they perform, if nobody did it, nothing would happen. How, how fulfilling is that? John, because we used him as an experiment with, you know, if I gave you $10 million, he says he would still work. But would you do anything like that? Would you keep the job that you have? Or would you say, I don't want to do this. I'm going to do whatever the hell I want and find work in that. So I think one of the problems that we have, and this is why I put this here, is we have put a value on being someone who works that is separate from is the work you do of value. Like when you evaluate a young person, let's say a 24-year-old person, they went to college, graduated at 22, or they didn't and they went straight into the workplace, but they're 24 years old, they have a job, and they pay their bills. That's an A plus in our society. But what if the things they do are completely pointless? They don't matter. If they didn't go to work for a month and got away with it and got their paycheck, nothing in their life would change and nothing at the company they work for would change. Or they're working 40 hours a week, but they honestly are working 20 and being paid for 40, but their life is under control for those 40 hours because they have to be in a place. Wouldn't it make more sense if... Because there's a lot, this is something if you've never employed people, it is very hard to understand. I will pay a person based on the value they give me week to week, month to month, year to year. I don't really care how much work they do. I care that the work I need done gets done properly. That's what I actually care about. If everything is going well, I am of the expectation that person will fuck off for 10 to 20 hours a week, and I'll tolerate it. But I will have them in a place so that they are on demand, like, oh, all of a sudden this thing came in, take care of it. So I'm paying you both for the work you do and to fuck off willingly. But if it could be structured, wouldn't it make more sense if that was Dennis here, who's joining us today, finally, a little late, he says, right? If it was Dennis and I had a job that needed doing and Jen- Dennis was actually dependable, and I knew it would get done. And I said, the job pays $500 a week. If you do it in three hours a week, I don't care. What would he do with his other 37 hours? And might he work three hours for me one week and 13 hours for me the next week and 35 hours for the next week and maybe 60 on the next week by his own volition and go back to two the following week because he's able to do that. So what is work? What what is meaningful? How much work that people do is meaningful? How much work that people do is meaningless? How much is not meaningless, but it's not that important? And how are we judging what is work? I mean, to me, work is anything that requires energy to accomplish. Whether I do it or a computer does it or a machine does it, it's work. I just picked up my coffee cup for those that are not in the video. I moved it to the other side and I set it down. That was work. It required energy and it required a skill set, albeit a very light one. And it requires enough knowledge. You know, I put it there to make a point. My right elbow will hit it and spill it. So I'm going to use work again to return it to where it was. That's work. It's not a job. It's not employment. So should people have to work? Should people have to be employed? Should people have to earn a living? Or should people have to just be responsible for their life, however they feel? And how do you design a society that acknowledges all of this? Yeah. Okay. Um, How many jobs are currently protected from technology? This was interesting when I did this episode in the past. I actually, I'll tell you what the original episode number was here in just a second, um, because I want to look up a comment made on it that fits this perfectly. And I'll tell you when it's from, and the comment was made by Insidious, who back when people used to actually make comments on blogs, made some of the most intelligent comments that anybody's ever made on it on the TSP blog. Uh, but here is what, by the way, it is episode 1605, and it was done in 2017, July of 2017. Let me find Insidious's comment right here. La, 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 la. It would be all the way at the bottom. Okay, yeah, this is really interesting to me. It fits this question. All right, so 
as a slightly different perspective to get the thoughts juices flowing, labor must be performed by to transform raw materials into things humans want. The labor is termed work. In my opinion, when we react to someone not working welfare, it is because we are working and they are not in our mind. This is unfair. This isn't just a response to welfare recipients, even young retirees, inheritance or uh, genius based are envied. So sometimes people are resentful. Somebody doesn't work when they work their ass off and we're able to retire at 40. Right. That's the must be nice syndrome. There's there's two kinds of people in the world. And one kind is the kind that always builds wonderful lives. And the other kind is the kind that never does. Even if they do well economically, they never really build anything. And that is when you see somebody that has something you'd like or you'd appreciate, like a really nice house or a car, a great family, whatever it is, there's two responses. Must be nice. That's the non-builder. Never really will have it for themselves. And then there is the good for them. Well, he's talking about the must be nice here. He says, now, so here comes technology. Now, all that work with possible exception of creativity will in a short period be able to be performed by a non-human slave. So the real question, who owns the slaves? If you own slaves, you are a Greek philosopher. Yep, that's how they had all that time to, quote, invent democracy. Yeah, all the people that invented democracy, the Greek philosophers, they all had slaves. Isn't that interesting? Um, if you don't own slaves, you're one yourself or you're obsolete. Non-human slaves are better, cheaper. So why keep you around consuming resources? To use an analogy from another show, you no longer need to be milked or bled. That is one of my analogies. It's time for the slaughter. In my opinion, not needing human slaves equals the collapse of consumerism. In many ways, the collapse of markets. For there to be a market, you need people with goods and services to trade. If your average person can't provide a competitive product, they're done. So again, in my opinion, the future looks very different. And the future is now. The future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Two paths, techno warlords or spontaneous self-government are the only possibilities without active suppression of technology, which would have to be global or the free society would shortly dominate the tech-fearing ones. The tech exists now for me to become a technical warlord dictator. The advantage to the old way being that human portion of the future dictator's entourage can be very small and completely controlled by the technology portion of the troops. Of course, this is ignoring some other more horrifying tech that's being uh, becoming available. Selective memory erasure. Mind reading machinery that makes dictators' jobs much easier. P.S. I'm voting for the spontaneous self-government path. Version 2, what I call gods and dirty people, maybe for another post. All right. So, again, this, this was originally 2015. Now, in 2015, I and a lot of people that help support what we do here were telling you about artificial intelligence. John Pugliano in 2015 or 2016 wrote, the robots are coming. Yeah. And when I did this episode in 2015, I put how many jobs are currently protected from technology in there because of this? A lot of you pushed back really hard back then. And I know it might not be you, the people listening today, but a lot of the audience back then pushed back really hard on this. You know, AI will never do what they say it'll do. What do you say now, eight years later, is you watch every random person with an internet browser have access to AI in the form of something like chat GPT? And you can mock it because it's wrong about things from time to time. But if you look at what it does, it's amazing. And the better you get with it, the better your results. When you ask it to write something, you have to tell it the style you want it written in or it writes it in British English. But if you tell it what you want it written in, it will do it. And if you, if you pay attention to the result and modify the request, it will continue to improve. How many jobs does this take away? He said, well, you know, if you're going to be a copywriter, chat BT can write, GPT can write copy, but you still have to fix it. You have to massage it. You have to play with it to do all that shit you just said, Jack. Yeah, but I could write 10 pieces of copy in a day instead of one, which means I can do the work of 10 copywriters, which means nine of them are out of a job. That's what it means. And then just take that wherever you want. And this is the big thing. 
I've said this forever, and people never wanted to hear it because a lot of you guys are the very target of AI. People think that the people most replaced by AI will be low-level workers. Person who flips a burger, we can make a machine that goes, and we can. But in general, that person's inexpensive. The only problem I have with that person is they quit, they don't show up. Right, The cost of that person is pretty low. The margin on that type of service is really high. Many people have become multimillionaires by owning a couple of McDonald's locations. We have one in this community who is doing amazing work with young men now and helping them get on the right track, who ran two McDonald's for, I think, a couple of decades, sold them both. He's multimillionaire, retired, and about my age. Right, So you can get really wealthy using teenage labor in a McDonald's, running a McDonald's, and those type of jobs. You can teach anybody how to do it in about a week. If they know how to show up on time, follow the rules, and not get in fights, anybody can do the job. Anybody can do it. So it's not a great target for AI. Yet, as AI scales and becomes more and more affordable and scalable down, you'll see more and more of it absorbed, but it's the last place. No, the guy that makes 120 grand a year, he's who I want to replace with a bot. That actually changes my bottom line. If I have a department of people that make between 100 and 200,000 a year, I probably have the highest paid person in that department. Probably all they are is a babysitter for reports and a bunch of fucking bullshit that I want fed to me to prove things are happening up. I probably don't need that person. And if I can get rid of the most expensive person in that department and, and that person was overseeing 12 and now I'm at 11 and I can cut eight out of the 11 and go down to three. And AI enables them to do their job at a rate where I don't need the rest of them. And AI takes that data, compiles it, and provides it to me where I know it's getting done. My $200,000 unit manager is fired. So what are they going to go do? What skills do they have? Are we going to send everybody back to the farm? What will we do with all this? And, and who is actually insulated? You'd say, well, a doctor. Are they really? Are doctors even in our society that we're trying to redesign today? Are doctors even permitted to actually do what a doctor's supposed to do anymore? Or there are rule, protocols that say, in this case, do these things. How many doctor positions could be eliminated? How many are being eliminated? They'll get rid of certain doctors before they do the nurses, because the nurses are doing a lot of the things that AI can't do yet, like cleaning your bedpan. So for now, those jobs are more safe. Again, when you look at this, you got to start realizing some of the highest paid, like mid-level, upper level, middle class. They're the ones right in the sites, right in the sites. So what do people really want in their lives? It's an interesting thing about liberty. I've, I've talked about liberty and how it can be defined as a macro for anybody. But it really can only be explained individually at the individual level because we would all do something different with full, total liberty, right? And that is about what you want in your life. So if you have enough money to buy anything you want and enough freedom to do anything you want, you and I might build very similar lives, but there will be differences. Maybe you're into football, so you travel around and watch your favorite football team play all over the country because you have the time and the money to do it. So when they're not at home, you're away with them. You stay in nice hotels and eat caviar. I wouldn't fault you for it. I'm not going to do it. I occasionally, and I mean very occasionally, watch a football game. It's not important to me. Don't care. Got nothing against it. Just don't care that much. I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan. Most of you guys know that, but it's not a big deal. I don't care because I know even if I'm watching a game and it's exciting and I'm happy about it when it ends, that if it's on Sunday by Tuesday, I won't even remember it. I won't even remember it. I don't care. It actually doesn't affect my life. But maybe, see, that's the thing. What would people do? What do they really want in their lives? I think what people really want in their lives is basic stability and the ability to pursue the things that they find interesting without being interfered with by others. I think that's pretty universally human. Then the psychosis, the psychopathy, right? Start to creep in. The person who's offered that and they're like, but this person over here, they're doing things I don't like. 
They shouldn't do that. Okay, are they doing it to children? No. Okay. Are they doing it to you? No. Okay. Are they doing it to another person at all? No. Are they doing it on their own property that they have a right to? Yeah. Is it spilling onto somebody else's property? No. Shut up. But we can't. We have this innate compulsion. Somebody's opposed to drugs. That dude smokes dope every day. Does he blow it in your face? No. Shut up. But it's causing self-harm. Do people have a right to self-harm? I personally think a person has a right to self-harm. I don't mean that we shouldn't try to intervene, that we shouldn't try to educate them. We shouldn't try to offer them an alternative. We shouldn't offer them help. But is it self-harm to eat a Twinkie every day? I say yes. Maybe you say no. Maybe one Twinkie a day, Jack, that's fine. I think it is very harmful. I think it is a path toward the destruction of your kidneys and a burden on our health care system. But I don't like the way our healthcare system works, and I think it could be better. And I don't think you should be told you're not allowed to eat a Twinkie. If I want to eat a, a, a Delta 8 gummy, that's not your business. It's legal now. So all of a sudden it was okay. But if I did it five years ago, the same person that says, well, it's legal, so it's okay, would say, lock them up. This is this psychopathic, sociopathic compulsion that humans have that once, and this is a problem, and this is, don't mistake this. It is being organized and contrived and used and leveraged as using people as useful idiots. But a big part of why people were primed to be set up for this ridiculous woke culture where people are picketing and protesting and shrieking and, and screaming about trans rights being human rights. And what they mean by trans rights is the right of a grown man dressed like a woman to wave his junk in a child's face. Part of why they were able to sell that to these people is that most of the things that the traditional left attacked as being unfair, as being discriminatory, have been solved. And now they basically have what they've always wanted, but now I feel itchy. I don't have anything to bitch about. So if you're going to design a society, you have to design one that contains that itch. You guys all want to go off and do whatever, fine, but you have to leave other people alone. Now, how do we do that? I'm not even here to tell you how we do any of this today. This is to get you thinking how you would do it. And then why would we do that, though? Well, because then you design your life as close to that as you can get. You accept the fact that all this crazy shit exists around you, but you try to create within your own circle of control as close to what you would design for yourself as possible. The more people that do that, the more, that's the number one way to wrest power from the state. The more people that do it, the less they're needed, the more they're turned their back, their backs are turned to them, and the more irrelevant they become. That is not a short process, by the way. That's not something we all get on board. We all do it. And by next year, the state's gone. No, this is back seventh generational thinking. Is there anything really approaching a resource shortage in the world? You see starving people all the time. Is there a food shortage in the world? Or is there enough food in the world for everybody to eat? The answer is there is enough food in the world for everybody to eat. I've done the math. I'm not going to do it today, but it's true. There is no true for human need resource shortage there is a resource allocation issue and so this is where the socialists step in and say well then we just need a resource a resource reallocation in other words take from people that have and give people that don't but this screws everything up this is this is to uh david who is uh insidious different david than the david i'm always mentioning um but this is this is was his point when you are given and I am taken from, it becomes a resentful situation. It is a class division, and I hate you, and you hate me, even though I'm the one paying your bills. Because the government tells you to hate me because they said we had to go force this greedy bastard to pay for you. And then most of the people that think they're paying for somebody else, you're not. You don't pay any significant taxes. There's tons of people, especially kind of the MAGA types. And again, this isn't kicking Trump. This is the truth. A ton of that base are people that make so little money that when it's all said and done, they pay almost no income tax. Over half the people in the United States don't pay any real income tax. By the time they get their refunds and everything else, they have no real outflow of income, especially if they have a couple kids. All right? They feel like they do, but they don't. Or what they pay is pretty small potatoes, a couple thousand a year. And not all of them are Democrats. 
and not of all of them are on welfare. There's an income threshold, especially for like a family of four or five, that so many people, there are so many people who fancy themselves taxpayers, and they are in a way, and I'll acknowledge that in a second, but when it comes to income tax, they actually get more than they pay. More than they pay. And a lot of them are what you would call middle income. Again, couple kids, standard deduction, et cetera. Um, earned income adjustment or something like that is what it's called. Minimum something. You get, get money back, though they paid in, you know, 10 grand and they get 12 grand back. It happens. But the, the whole purpose of this is to create this hatred of this other person. They have too much. I have too little because they have too much. They have what was taken from me. This is all manipulation and control. It's not that it's not true to some degree, but what we do is we make a, a, a watch that's 15 minutes wrong. And that's a dangerous watch. A 15 minute wrong watch can make you miss a flight or a meeting. A two hour wrong watch, you're like, that's wrong. You know it's wrong. So we use the truth to sell a lie. And make your brother your enemy. And we've done it so well now that families refuse to even have Thanksgiving together because someone didn't get a shot or someone did get a shot or some voted, voted one way or somebody didn't vote. They've, they've executed their plan perfectly. That's why we're discussing this today. So how would you? Because the, I'm going to give you how government justifies its existence. I told you we need it for individual protection and stability. But what does government say about itself? Well, we feed the planet. Without us, there'd be starving people everywhere. Now, this is an interesting thing that I've always found about my position. Initially, I was what I would call a libertarian, a minarchist libertarian. And eventually I moved to full-on anarcho-libertarian, where I, I always say that all anarchists are libertarians, but not all libertarians are anarchists, right? Um, but even when I was a minarchist libertarian, I was like, well, how would you prevent starving people? Do we have starving people now? Yes. Okay, so you're not doing it. I don't have to make sure no one starves. If my system would result in 1% less people being starving or hungry, it's better than yours. And this is something we just, we tend not to really think about. We, we tend not to really think about this in that we don't, a solution doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be better than what we have. And as I go through this, I want you to think about the fact that everything people bring up when you talk about the scary word, voluntarism, anarchism, but then we would have, we already have it. So we have hungry people right now. How would you feed our planet? And, and don't say permaculture, right? You know, don't say backyard gardens. You have to think way bigger than that. There's people, they'll never grow a blade of grass in their life. But they contribute to society and they have money and they need to be able to buy food from somebody who does produce it or from a system that produces it. Do you talk about feeding the world here? Well, let's just say the United States. How would you feed the country? It's really easy to say you could do it better. But do you understand the complexity that goes into one grocery store? One grocery store. One big Kroger, one big Albertsons. How many trucks roll in and out? How many can interconnected things there are? The government may suck, but they, they put up an environment where the incentive exists for people to fulfill that goal. And so what would you do to feed our planet? I would personally, myself, say I, I can't do that. No one can. Parcel incentive, individual incentive, corporate incentive, all those things exist. As long as there's hungry people, there will be people to produce food for them. But what we need to do is clear the way. But what I can do is I can make sure my I can do what I'm doing now. Remember, we carve out our own bubble. I can grow my own food and I can teach other people how to do it. And I can form an economy based on this and then let that spread as it sees fit and let other people come up with their solutions. And I think that's what you'll find in this, that the way we would design a society, if they let us do it, if they actually cleared the way, for us to do it. We would channel individual creativity. We would put out ideas and we would let people participate and we would get out of the way. We wouldn't tell somebody who's currently feeding homeless people in Florida that they're going to jail for feeding homeless people. By the way, that's happened. We've had pastors 
who go out and feed homeless people every day arrested. If in a sane society we'd go, well, look at that. We're not paying him. He's using the resources in his own church. People are voluntarily putting up food to feed homeless people. They can make an individual determination who's abusing and not abusing the system. Those people are eating now. Since they're eating, they're less likely to harm others. Maybe we should leave them alone. But no, we go in and say, you're, you're, see, what upsets the psychopath is you replacing their system that they have sold you the need for. They didn't sell you the system. They sold you the need for this. So you need us to do this. How would you feed the wall? How would you incentivize the development of technology? And you have to really think on these questions because there's some uncomfortable reality to what's incentivized some of the great geniuses in the world. One of the major incentivizers of the geniuses that have created some of the most advanced technology in the world is the ability to sell it to the government. I mean, we can go back to Leonardo da Vinci that some of his inventions were invented with the intent that since it would be good for warfare, for instance, you could sell it to the government and the government had tons of money and would buy as much as you could make once you converted the sale. Now, for someone that hates the state, I don't really like saying that, but it doesn't mean that it's not true. It doesn't mean that there's not been tremendous innovations because of policies of the state. So if you remove that, I think individual incentives still exist. I think people still want to develop systems. I just think you would have to develop something so valuable in the minds of others, they would voluntarily participate in it. But how would you do it? How would you incentivize development of technology? How would you provide medical care? That's another thing. Well, there'd be people dying in the streets and have hospital bills they can't pay. And we have that. Well, they don't have it in Canada. No, but you might have to wait 14 months for medical care on something that's going to kill you in eight. Or, you know, they might tell you, hey, you know, you're really kind of a burden on the system now. Why don't you kill yourself? Why don't you kill yourself? That's kind of some policy that's coming out in some of these socialist societies. It starts out with, well, when somebody's really old and they're terminally ill, they should be allowed to have assistance to die. And then the, the see, this is what states always do. They, 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 they set a level that a normal person would tend to agree with. Now, the whole human life thing, there's a religious component. Only God can decide. But I, I'm going to say, if you put it up for a vote, should a person with less than two weeks to live who is in pain, who has no chance of surviving, be able to end their life if they choose to in a peaceful, painless manner? Right? I think you'd get way more than 51% say absolutely. No one's coercing them. No one's cajilling them. They're the one that has to lay there for the next two weeks, choking on their own fluids in their lungs. I have no right to force that person to do that. And if they would like the ability to do so, they should be able to do so without doing something really stupid that's going to be incredibly painful, they should be able to acquire whatever is necessary to do that peacefully. Yeah. And then we just start lowering the bar until the inconvenient go into a eugenics program and disappear. All the shit that went on Nazi Germany, you know what it started out with? Sterilization of undesirables ability to reproduce, right? So you had these people, they were slow, mentally slow. There was something really physically wrong. We don't kill them. We just, we don't want any more people that are a burden to society. So we'll just make sure they can't reproduce. <laughs> you know where it all started. Go do your research right here in the United States of America. The United States of America implemented some, some of the very first and earliest eugenics programs that Nazi physicians and scientists modeled in Germany. In fact, Germany had a group of scientists at one point write a letter to the United States congratulating us on have the courage to like start sterilizing mentally defective people. That's where that came from. It's interesting, isn't it? I find it interesting. So how are we going to provide medical care in a society without the state dictating everything? Again, I think we're back to incentive, but I'm interested in what you would do. What would you do? If you were in charge and you couldn't shirk it, like it really was all on you. You had to start making decisions. You were dictator of the United States, right? And there's a lot of things I would remove, but even removing things, how fast and in what way you do so. 
Uh, here's an example, a real world recent example of where I completely agreed, and I mean completely agreed, with the mainstream viewpoint. Um, the mainstream viewpoint of it was time, but the means by which it was done were wrong and, and therefore have extremely long-term consequences. K Bonk, thank you for the super chat. I really appreciate it. Um, he says, mind bending thoughts. Thank you so much. I, that's what I'm hoping to do is make you think, right? So if you ask me, should the United States get out of Afghanistan a year before Biden did the withdrawal? I would have said yes. And they, and if you said, well, when I would have said yesterday, I was all for withdrawal, but the way that it was done was positively a disaster that cost lives, both American lives and Afghan lives. And it armed the Taliban to the teeth. I don't have all the Intel, but I'm just going to say even completely spitballing my plan for evacuation would have worked a lot better. I would have told the Taliban, if we see you, you die. If we see you, you die. They were caravanning in from all around out of the mountains once we said we were leaving. I would have had a, a Spectra C-130 in the air making circles. And you see them coming in, burp, gone. And you're like, you would have killed a bunch of people. No, actually, I wouldn't have. Because if they doubted it, the first time one disintegrated, and you with a, a C-130 Spectra and you're in a, a Toyota or something rolling in, you will disintegrate. I promise you. It would have stopped. I would have orderly withdrawn everything, taken every piece of U.S. equipment. This whole idea that the Afghans were going to stand up, nobody believed that. Nobody believed it. I would have taken all our, I would have left them nothing. There would have been nothing there for them. The people that we worked with, again, I was opposed to the whole thing. But since we were there, I'm in charge. I didn't decide to go. I got to get out. All the people that really helped us, that were at risk because they helped us, front of the line to get out, any kind of riots or anything, you're getting maced, you're getting, I don't want to do this, but you put me in a situation, you are getting driven back. And we are going to get the people, and we know, we knew who those people were by the very nature of the fact they were working with us. I would have got them out, I would have got our people out, and I would have said, run your own country now, it's up to you. Is that perfect? No, but I bet it's better. I wouldn't have ended up right after our men were killed, bombing innocent civilians in Afghanistan as retribution and getting the wrong house. That wouldn't have happened. So when I say, how would you provide medical care? Or how would you do any of these things? Well, I'll just get rid of all these departments of government. And I'll, well, what are they doing now? What purpose are they serving? How do you withdraw from this position? Look at Social Security. I think Social Security is a Ponzi scheme. I think it's an absolute disaster. I think it is hell-bent for bankruptcy. I am for elimination of Social Security. And I don't mean tinkering with it. I don't mean saving it. I mean it going away. But the withdrawal strategy has to be there are people at various stages of their lives that have been taken from continuously with an expectation of receiving it back in their old age. And they, a lot of people have sat down with, like, I'm talking hardworking people with decent jobs that have held a job their entire life. And they have sat down and they have developed a retirement program based on the stability that this thing would be here. If that person is 30, you might tell them, tough luck, Skippy. You got another 35 years, figure it out. But if that person's 59, and at the end of their career, well, now what? So there, I don't know what the answer is. I don't pretend to know what the answer is. There has to be an extraction plan that figures out, like, these people, no matter what we got to do, they got to get what they were told. Maybe this group in the middle, they get some. And then this is the point where it's all zero. And now it goes away. And everything's better in the future. It's going to hurt. It's a type one error. We should have never did it in the first place. It should have never existed. You want to know how to run? Something like Social Security, if you're even as a mandatory program, simply better, simply better than we do right now. There would be no Social Security fund. There would be a mandatory government bond program. Even with an employee, I wouldn't do this. Again, this is mental experimentation. All I'm trying to do is be better. 
It would work like this. The U.S. government savings bonds actually pay better across time, even with ups and down fluctuations and all that, than Social Security ever will for you. They do. I'm not making it up. It is what it is. That's how it works. So your money would go into an individual account purchasing government bonds. The government can then use that money to do things because you've loaned it to them. They are on the hook to pay you back for specific contributions at a specific interest rate, depending on bond rates throughout your entire working career. Is that perfect? No. Is it even really good? Would I do it if I was in charge? No. Is it better than the current Social Security Administration system? A hundred times better. And I've done the math that proves it. Again, I don't have time to go into math today, but I've done the math on it. It's not hard. You can go to a retirement calculator, you can get bond rates, aggregated average per year across time, and go plug the numbers in yourself and look at what your retirement would look at, like, like at 65, okay, with those bonds, and, and determine for yourself. And understanding you would start drawing from the L oldest bonds first. Then you would set up, a, your retirement would be, okay, when I say 100 times better, I mean 100 times better from a functional standpoint. It's not 100 times better on ROI, but it's about 2x. The average person on Social Security Day would have a stipend for the rest of their life about double what they'll ever get from SSI, no matter how long they wait to retire. Oh, and it would be your money and your bonds. So then the government doesn't get to say you have to work to your 65. Oh, now 67. Oh, now 69. It wouldn't work that way the bonds themselves would be redeemable. So if you decided you were done at 40, you could start redeeming your bonds. So it's better. It's not great. How about, how would you allow for freedom of expression, religion, etc.? Now, here's the thing. Those of us that describe the non-aggression principle are like, you don't have to allow for it. You just don't screw with people. But what if your religious expression involves violation of the non-aggression principle? Who decides what's a violation of the non-aggression principle? I think rational people like you and I, we, we have a pretty good idea. We would agree 99% of the time. There's a lot of people, especially in our screwed up society today. They think not using the right pronoun when you refer to them is aggression. How do you prevent that creep? Do you simply design a system that won't allow for that? That's one way. Or do you design a system that allows for that, for people that want to be part of that, but they have to do it on their own and they can't force it on others? Or is it sort of both? I don't pretend to know. I don't know. I don't pretend to know. What about educational services? How would you see the education? You know, one of the things I said under stability and protection was the collective good. Okay, I'm going to say something that if you don't know me, you might be, he's gone left hardest or something. Like He's a statist. I'm not. And I'm not saying the how is part of this. I'm saying this is the truth. Society is better off when most people are basically educated at a minimum. Our society is better if the average person can read and write and do basic, basic math and think with some level of logic and has some historical context on the world, some knowledge of geography, basic education. There is no case that can be made that we are not all better off if we have education as a fundamental in our society for children, right? It is a collective good. And if you don't think it's a collective good, go somewhere where there is no real education, where, you know, the Ill illiteracy rate is in the 70 or 80 percentile. And you'll see right away, we will have more stability in a society with an educated population. Now, the thing is, education is dangerous if you're a statist. People learn the wrong think, the wrong thought, the wrong speak. And learn to think too much for themselves. And by God, how many times have you heard in the last three years, I can't stand people that do their own research. Just stupid. I mean, you guys know how stupid a person saying that sounds. But they don't think they're stupid. And the people that believe them don't think they're stupid either. 
They think doing your own research is bad because they've been educated to believe it. Now, to me, there is a common ethos of basic education. Two plus two is four. How you feel doesn't matter. Mathematics are objective. They are quantifiable. They have concrete answers. And it's why some people are very strong in math and some people aren't. Some people really love that the, a math problem, if you know how to do math, doesn't require an answer key. If you're wrong, reworking the problem, even if you don't get the right answer, should tell you you're wrong. Now, when you start looking at some like Einsteinian shit and stuff like that, you have to be real. You really don't know what you're doing. But imagine these equations that some of these physicists develop. They can develop the equation, but they can't solve it. But they know the equation's valid. It has to be worked on. How do they know when they've solved it? Because it's subjective. It can be checked in reverse. You can run a, a, a differential equation against it and check it. In accounting, it's much more simple. Assets equal liability plus capital. The two sides of the balance sheet should equal. And it's so objective. It's so objective that if the difference, if it's a disparagement and the difference is 81, i.e. divisible by nine, it's inevitably a transposition error somewhere in all the data. It could be thousands of lines of entry. You were supposed to put in 17, you put 71. If that happens and it's the only error in your calculations on a balance sheet of a company, the difference will always be divisible by nine. It's objective. History is objective and subjective. There was this person named this thing. They did live in this time and they were part of this war. And they served in this war, in this capacity, and they did these things. That's not subjective. Assuming nobody lied, that's objective. They were on the good guy's side. Subjective. For education to work, you have to have this varied approach so that when you have... A mental exercise like we're doing right now, everybody should have different ideas. You should think some of my ideas are stupid. And some of the ideas that you think are stupid probably are. And some of the ideas that I float that you think are stupid maybe are not. Both of those things can be true. And likewise, some of your ideas that you think are brilliant are probably stupid. Some of your ideas you think are brilliant, I might think are brilliant too. We might both, both, both be wrong. So we need somebody with an ed educational path to point out the flaws in our thinking. And yet at the same time, there has to be a point where, what's the old proverb? Those who say a thing can't be done should get out of the way of the people actively doing it. So there needs to be the freedom to experiment. If I say I have a better way to build housing, and you say the house is going to fall on top, everybody's going to die. And I say, hey, look, guys, over here, if you want to come do this with me, I'm building some housing. I got my own piece of land I bought. State can go screw itself. This is my piece of land. I paid for it. It's unproven. You should get engineering help when you follow my plans, but we're going to develop this community this way. Shouldn't I be left alone to do it? Might we just figure out a good way to do it? How many times are they using safety? And it's a lie. And it's a lie. If I develop a community that produces no waste for disposal, there, and I'm not saying anybody has to starve. I'm not talking about a 15-minute WEF city under Agenda 2030. I'm saying if I develop a community and we develop our own processes, that everything that comes in, it's in a box. The box doesn't go to the landfill. The product is that end of life cycle. Or let's say we go from 50 families all putting out three giant garbage bags a week to 50 families putting out three garbage bags for the community a week for things we can't handle ourselves. I should get a Nobel Prize if I build that. If I have a plan to build that right now, if I have a plan to build that right now, and the people that are in charge believe the plan will work, and I'm foolish enough to ask for permission instead of just do it, and Otherwise, I am following every law to the letter in building this community. I know you're going to have a hard time accepting this. But right now, massive roadblocks would immediately be put up because we have a system of influence for hire. 
and I know this for a fact. And I mean, you're talking mafia level, like New York City, 1970s mafia level shit going on in the waste disposal industry. There are people that are billionaires because they move garbage from a house to a landfill. And there's a lot of millionaires and multimillionaires in between the billionaires and the poor people in that industry. And they are not agreeable people. I was part of a project, a pilot project I was consulting on in Austin, Texas. It was like business percolators and recycling and all time. And it was a brilliant program. I helped the company that was doing it develop the strategy to present to the Austin board to do this. And they even like saw this as a social engineering challenge. They figured out how to make sure that the people that get rid of the garbage didn't lose anything. All it was is some of the garbage you pick up, you bring it here instead of it all going to the same place. And you actually get paid a little bit more to bring it here. And they literally were told, and I mean like pulled aside by like a big guy with a bunch of rings that looks like a guy that breaks fingers for a living. We're not interested in what you're doing. And you need to shut up and you need to go away. And this is not happening here. And they went from a very excited Austin board to two weeks later being told, yeah, we're not doing any of this. That's just waste disposal. So when I say we need to redesign society, I'm not bullshit. That shouldn't happen. That shouldn't happen, but it does. How are we going to design our communities, our villages, and our towns in that system? I thought we were supposed to reduce waste. They tell you that all the time. But the minute you try to do it, they shut you down. And it ain't just the, the, the mafiosa, the would-be mafiosa running garbage trucks that does it. If it was just him, that's a violent person. Violent people are easy to, to deal with. You bring violence to me, I bring violence back to you. You know the whole, there's a whole meme going around now. Uh, fuck around and fi find out. Right? Fuck around and find out, right? And the meme, some guy created this matrix. It's like, you fuck around at a five, you find out at a five. No, no, no. There's a flaw in that formula, right? The way this works is you fuck out around at a five, you find out at a six. You don't go from a five to a 10. You fuck around at a three, you find out at a four. So you can deal with that. Oh, really? Okay. Well, we're going to do it. And if you come and you come to bother us, we're going to push back. But when you take the law of stupidity, you take Bonhoeffer's theory of stupidity and you put stupid people who have been made stupid by a system in charge of the system. And then you take the violent actor, the malicious actor, and you give them influence within the system of the stupid. They have a lot more authority and a lot more power because they did. Th and I mean, this is a legitimate true story. These people were physically like implied physical threat but what actually shut it down was the the board within the austin city government that said no we're not going to do this was so i'm sure fat tony went to them and explained hey you know it'd be a shame if you didn't have your job next year i don't know man maybe i you know maybe that guy that's always wanted your job maybe i like him better than you yeah yeah Remember all the favors I did for you and all the favors you did for me. You wouldn't want any of that getting out. Because I'm not the one in trouble for doing you favors, but you're in trouble for doing... See, that's how it works too with government, right? Like the guy on the outside doing the favor for the politicians never really in trouble. The politician's the one that's in trouble. It's an out... It's, it's kind of like an outer orbit version of regulatory capture. Instead of the fact that the FDA is now controlled by the drug industry, it's much easier to co-opt a city council, a town council, et cetera. Or even in, in this case, a board, an unelected board that's appointed by elected officials who were funded by the people that are doing the threatening. Maybe I talked to Bill. Maybe you don't have this job no more. Yeah. Remember that stuff that I did for you? Like, that's how this went down. So how do you avoid that? And how do we design? Then, like, take away the problem and say, okay, go do it. Well, what would you do? What would a community look like that you designed? That's another show we, we did in the past. We're going to do that again maybe next week. We're just going to pretend I have 
a thousand acres, big square, road access in, electrical at least to the edge of the property, and I'm going to divide, design a town and ask people to come live in it and to build it and to be part of it and to be pioneers in it. And they're actually going to like a free zone. They're going to leave us alone. Then what would you do? I'm asking you now, though. What, think about that. So when we have that episode next week, you can be ready for it. What would you do? How would you design, you know, a village, a town, something as big as a county, as big as a state? Where would you draw the line? Would you say we shouldn't be designing a state? And I don't mean uppercase state. I mean Texas, Florida, Georgia, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Do, do you have a point? See, I do, but I'm not saying you should. This is mental experimentation. I think there's a point where any individual group should stop at a certain geographic size or a headcount size. Like, we run our shit here. Over there, you run your shit. We need a means by which to do business with each other and what have you. But we don't need to, like, I don't need to be telling anybody in Houston how to live. And we're even in the same state. I believe that. I have no business telling anybody in Houston jackedly shit about how to live. And I don't believe anybody in Houston has any right to tell me how to live. Or anybody in Austin has any right to tell me how to live. I don't believe anybody in freaking Dallas has a right to tell me how to live. And it's only 18 miles away. Because the crow flies anyway. I don't believe that anybody in Fort Worth, even though I have a Fort Worth address, should be telling me how to live. I live out here. And mostly because I was strategic, I, that's what I have. But I only have that because of the unique form of governance that exists in the state of Texas for unincorporated areas. In a lot of places, a lot of places I would fall under the county seat's regulation. So Fort Worth's regulations would apply in the county, even if the sheriff enforced them. Doesn't happen here. We have one county that, that, that broke that. And unfortunately, I was going to try to do a development there. And when I found out about it, I, I couldn't do it. And it was all over the super collider shit that will let go. But how would you do it? What would it look like? Would, see, I think the idea of a 15-minute city as a thing, not as planned, not behind there. The idea that I could be anywhere within the city or town to get anything I need using either some form of public transportation or on my feet or a bicycle in 15 minutes is a great idea. It's a one... like. Who wouldn't want that other than maybe you want 20 acres and that doesn't work because it would take longer than that to get across your 20 acres. But if you're going to live in a town, in a community, or even if you are going to have the 20 acres on the outskirts of that town, being able to get to the town and then park your car and do everything and then go home without actually driving your car in, great. As long as I still can if I need to. Wonderful idea. However, however, how would you do it? What would it, I'm talking about architecture now. Start thinking about things. We're going to do that again. Okay. Um, how would you protect individual rights? If you're an anarchist like me, you would say it's pretty much up to the individual and collective groups of individuals to defend their own rights. Let's say you're not ready to go there yet. Let's say you're somewhere in the minarchist world. Where would the authority of the state end? Would it be what Oliver Wendell Holmes, former Supreme Court justice, said? The right to swing my fist ends exactly where the other man's nose begins. Sounds good. Makes sense. I get the analogy. But what about the whole not touching can't get mad, not touching can't get I'm not touching you. I'm not touching you, right? The game that kids play in the back of the car. He's on my side, right? That happens like grown-ass adults act like children, right? Antifa, is that's their game. They do these demonstrations. They get a response they're looking for. The right wingers come out and then Antifa just uh, 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 and tries to make them go first. Or they actually do violate the non-aggression principle, but they do it like when you were a kid and you wanted to get your brother in trouble. So you made sure dad wasn't looking and you thumped him in the ear and then he punched you and you went, oh, dad, he hit me. They do that shit. How do you stop it? How do you stop it if you're going to have a state? How do you prevent the state from going too far? How do you limit that authority and that power? I think one of the ways is that you make being a dickhead have consequences again. Right now, being a dickhead is a protected class. It really is. Like criminals are afforded more protections than the average person, especially in states like California. I'm in California. I have a business. I've had a business for 30 years, been paying $10,000 a year in property tax for the last 10 years, been paying it for 30 years, but it's gone up over time. 
right? Because even though the residential is protected from property tax increases in California, business really isn't. I'm paying this huge amount of tax every year, huge amount of income tax. All this shit I have to do to employ people, a homeless dude with needle tracks up and down his arms is shitting on my entry steps. And I go out and go, don't shit there. I'll do whatever I want. Pump some heroin and for And I physically, rem- I don't beat this guy up. I grab him, push him off my property and say, that's what I pay for. That's mine. Stay the hell out. He runs to a cop and says, I assaulted him. They will come arrest me. That's where we are. We're not supposed to be there, but we are. The, the Constitution. We have the Constitution, and this is where we are. How do you stop this? Because I'm going to tell you where human inclination goes. It's not where you would think. When we have a problem like this, you would think people would snap to, we need more freedom and liberty so that that individual would have the authority to remove that guy from taking a dump on his stairs. That's a totally reasonable thing. And most people in our community, that's where you would go. You know where the average person that that's not a left-wing lunatic with the leftist version of the state? You know where most of the people that are middle, centrist, right-leaning, moderate liberal, all the way over to right-wing, do you know where they go to solve that problem? Full authoritarianism. Well, we need a law that says if you that's that's public exposure, it's public indecency. Like there's like 12 laws that were violated. That person should be locked up for a year with the key thrown away. That's where most people go with that. Not, hey, let's make this something that you can't just no understanding that the state created the environment where this occurs in the first place. I guarantee you, go back to when public sanitation was a lot less than it is today. Before the advent of the car being a normal thing in America and most people having a car and the trains and everything. Go back, go back to just 1900. Go find pictures of New York city in 1900. It looks like traffic jams, but it's all horses and buggies and donkeys and stuff like that. And there's donkey shit, horse shit throughout the streets. There's people are only job clean up the horse shit. Okay. Go back to that time, that reckless, dirty time. I bet nobody was shitting on somebody's front porch of their business. And if you did and you got the crap kicked out of you, they'd be like, well, why do you get the crap kicked out of him? He went down to Bill's saloon and took a crap on the stairs. Oh, screw him. It was all, so it didn't happen. The state enabled this by creating these people as protected classes. But how do you fix it? Me giving you the problem doesn't fix it. How do you enforce rules? With a minarchist government or no government at all? What kind of... See, I think part of it is that you create an environment where natural law kicks in. Uh, Friday's show is already recorded. My quote of the day is about the fact there is no appeal to nature. That if you're in front of a judge in a court of law, you can appeal. And I don't mean the appeals process. I mean, you can ask for mercy. You can prevent mitigating circumstances of the evidence, how you're not really a bad guy. You have no criminal record. Yes, this was a horrible mistake. Yes, I regret it. I know you could put me in jail for 10 years, Your Honor, but maybe a year, some probation, anything. I am not a bad person. I'm a person who made a bad choice. You can appeal. You deal with nature, you can jump off a building 100 stories high, and you can appeal all the way down to story one, But when you reach zero, there is no appellate process. Splat. And the person that didn't make the mistake, that just happened to be walking by, if you land on them, they don't get to appeal to nature either. So I think if you reanimate natural consequences, people will learn through pain. See, as a teacher, every good teacher, whether you're a sports coach, a military person training recruits, a corporate person, a teacher, you know there's actually only two ways to teach people. Pleasure and pain. That's it. That's it. Like, I mean, there's people that are natural learners. They Like, I used to be told in school by my friends in, like, science class, you just eat the book. 
you just read the book, you know the book, you don't give a shit anymore, you know everything. Like, and it's because it wasn't hard, by the way. Like high school science in 1988 was not hard. Like you had I think you had to be dumb to fail. I really did. So, like, there are people that will just naturally absorb information, learn. But when you're actually trying to teach somebody and they're having trouble developing a skill or a knowledge base or an application of the skill or the knowledge, you have two ways to motivate and to reinforce memory, pleasure, and pain. And that's it. Pleasure is something that you prefer as a good teacher. Pain is something that is generally more effective. In the military, what they used to tell us all the time, when we would be training in the field and it's, 6 15 in the morning and the dude from the air force is walking by with a bag of donuts and a coffee right and he's he's on his way to the hangar for a normal job and you the army grunt are laying in the field while it rains and you're rolling around and you have mud in your ear and if you touch the mud to get it out of your ear they'll scream at you because you just got your head blown off by a sniper because you didn't have discipline you're going through that you know what they tell you men those who sweat the most in peacetime, bleed the least in war. And whether we should be fighting wars or not, that statement is true. That pain reinforces these are the things that must be done. If you think back across your life, if you have a, a mistake you made that you will never make again, I promise you one thing about it, either physically or emotionally it hurt. You do a thing and it was a mistake, but it didn't actually hurt anybody or you. You tend to make that mistake again. Or if the pain is very slow and ongoing, like a substance abuse problem, you do it forever. But if you do something that's acutely painful, like touch a stove burner, you never do it again. How many of you, especially in the live feed, there's almost 100 of you now, which you better get some more likes or Eka Mouse will show up and she will be angry, right? How many of you ever made the mistake of getting too close to an electric fence? OK, where you you leaned over, you reached through, you didn't think you were going to hit it. And it pulsed just when your bicep was there. And it, that 25 mile box popped you in the arm. If you're a dude, it put your 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 junk in your back pocket for a half a second. Right. How many of you did it? How many of you did it twice? I bet if you got an honest group of 100 random TSPers that have been around electric fences, how many of you ever have been accidentally popped by an electric fence? More than half the hands would go up. If I asked how many people did it twice, two or three hands left up, maybe. Three times, probably not a hand. Because that freaking, well, you will never forget that experience. You will never put yourself in a position to let it happen to you again if you can at all avoid it. Now, you might not know it's there. But if you see a wire, you're not like, oh, let me see if it's on, right? You're assuming it's on. So pain is the best teacher, but trainers prefer to use pleasure. And sometimes we have to not be afraid to use discomfort. Pain is not always bad. Pain is not always actually hurting somebody. Sometimes pain is, well, my grandson's doing an essay on the ethics of hard work because discussing it hasn't gotten through. So it will be a painful experience, though it's not harmful for him to have to do extra work to explain why he should try, try to avoid work. Makes sense? Hope so. Uh, next. How would you have government without a state? I think a lot of times as anarchists in our anarcho community, we do a disservice to those who are open to our ideas but are not willing to walk across yet in that we don't have this discussion. We say anarchy is without rulers, not without rules. But we don't exactly discuss how rules would be enforced. And I don't want to, you know, I'm at an hour and 40 minutes right now, so I don't want to go too deep into that today. I need to wrap up early so I can get the rest of the week done. Get out of here. Um, but yeah, we don't. And I think that if you want to actually bring people, like there's people that are so much a status left and right, both, you will never even bring them close to libertarianism. There's a lot of libertarians that are, true like LP party libertarians, even if they're not a member of the party. And there's also an awful lot of Democrats and Republicans that self-identify that way, that vote in the system. They're actually very libertarian minded, but they use class warfare to keep them entrenched on their side of the fence. And they also can't see how to move toward that libertarian gradient. So we need to start discussing 
I said, some of this is about allowing natural consequences because you learn from them. But we should have rules. And I think those rules are best set by the people that live under those rules. You know, one of the people we had on recently about land use codes in Colorado, one of the big problems they have with this board that's changing the land use codes and how things have to be is that none of the people on that board actually live where the change will affect them. They all live in town. And this violates that board's own rules. They're doing it anyway. But I don't think anybody should have any say on how somebody else lives in a place where they're not affected by the rule that they make or enforce. I don't think that's why I don't think anybody from Fort Worth, even though it's 15 minute drive, should be able to tell me what to do because they will not have their life changed by making a new rule for me. And I don't think I should be able to tell them how to live because I will not have my life changed by making a new rule for them. Now, if they come out here and they're driving around, they don't want to look at messy or whatever. That's their problem. They came here. And if I go downtown Fort Worth and downtown Fort Worth is not part of the oligarchy or anything. Downtown Fort Worth is a legitimate community run location. And they say, for instance, in Fort Worth, you can't carry a gun. I disagree with the sentiment, but I recognize the right of people to make that determination. I may not go there then. I may not go there then. And I'm okay with that because I know this is what people get f- freaking tunnel vision on. But I have the right to defend. Yes, you do. And if we had this open system, there'd be plenty of places you could go that would compete for the type of person you are that you'd be able to go do that. You just go to a different place. I shouldn't have to. There's a lot of things people should and shouldn't have to do. But the universe doesn't care. I think it creates any rule at all should have to live under the rule they created or they have no right to create that rule. And I think people that are going to create rules, if we're going to have anything approaching a government or a board, or whatever, have to be educated to the thing they're regulating. One of the biggest problems I have, not just that it's a violation of what I believe to be an innate human right to possess property and have individual self-defense with these people that want gun control, isn't just that it's a violation of those two principles. It's that they have no idea what the flying shit they are talking about. They know nothing about guns. If you don't know anything about guns, you should not have any right to regulate guns, even where you live. People that know about guns should be able to do that. Not you. And they don't know anything. And they make sure that the populace doesn't know anything. And they think that a rifle that's black is more dangerous than one that's brown. And they think that a rifle that's black that shoots a 22 caliber round is more lethal than a rifle that's brown and shoots a 30 caliber round that because they're just that stupid. Because they're just that stupid. Just that stupid. And they should have no right to do that. But how do we create a government without a state? How do we create something like that? How do we design that? Because I think we would all agree there has to be rules. There has to be rules. And I think rules should be voluntary, but there's also like entering into contract. So you are under no obligation to give me money. Yeah? None. But if we enter into a contract that I will let you market something under licensure and you need to pay me 10% of the sales, then you are under obligation you've entered into it. So a community that you move into should be able to say, these are the rules. These are the rules. And when you go to that community... If you would like to be part of what we're doing, then these are the rules. And that's a contract. And that's a voluntarily entered contract. And nothing should prevent you from leaving. And nothing should prevent you from coming. But you should have to follow the rules. And how do we enforce those rules? And I think one of the easiest ways is if you give people actual freedom, liberty, and autonomy, if you violate the rules, you can't stay. You can't stay. You can go violate those rules somewhere else. Now there's violent crime and things like that. That's not where I'm going with this. I'm going like, should I be able to burn wood in my backyard to produce a smoke? I think the community should discuss that. And I think what you would find is it would probably be, okay, you can do that. Here's the things you need to do to make sure this fire doesn't spread. And here's the time of day this is acceptable. Uh, I went to a community many years ago near Denton, Texas. It's like an earthship community, except I wouldn't actually call them earthships because I didn't see a, a, a pounded tire one. They were basically earth in earth 
structures. They were like poured con. It was very beautiful. And it was, I was in this dude's house talking to him. He was an artist. It was August. So it's not exactly a cool time of year in Texas. And he had no air conditioning and it, I was totally comfortable. And I don't like heat at all. And I could hear a generator running and some power tools running. And I, I said, you know, it's really peaceful except for that noise. He goes, oh, that noise is allowed between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. Monday through Friday for people to build and do construction and stuff like that. And then outside of that time, that all has to stop. I thought it was totally reasonable. Now, do I think that Denton County should be able to pass that law? No, Denton County's too big. That's somebody passing a law about a noise problem that they don't ever have to deal with in the first place. And maybe their neighbor doesn't give a shit. Maybe they like noise. That's between the people that live close enough to each other to be affected by each other's options, actions. What's our alternative to answering all these important questions, though? If we don't fix these problems, then who will? And the answer is the state will never fix these problems. The state does not benefit from solving problems. Let's say that one more time in case you're just a slow kid. The state doesn't benefit from solving problems. The state benefits from regulating, controlling, managing problems. Every time a problem is completely solved, the need for the state is in decline. If we actually, like, we took 10 of the biggest problems in society and got rid of five of them, don't you think we'd have some room to eliminate some government? Okay, who in government wants that? Who wants to lose their job? I mean, government is becoming a safe haven place for employment. Even if they use AI and government, they still will employ people because they need that giant freaking union voter block. And you're not spending your own money. As a private business person, I have a tremendous incentive. I have a tremendous incentive to get rid of problems and to get rid of employees that I don't need. I have a huge incentive to do it. As a government, I have zero incentive to do it. As a bureaucrat, I get paid more the larger my bureaucracy is, the more people that work for me. If I lay somebody off, I'm literally cutting my own future raise, my own importance within the organization. That's how I'm judged as a bureaucrat. How many people report to you? Two? Eh. Three? Eh. Ten? Okay. Twenty? Whoa. A hundred, ah, you're a director level or some shit, right? Yeah. So why would I ever want to reduce problems? I love problems if I'm in government. It's the entire justification of my existence. So the answer to who's going to solve it if we don't is nobody. They'll make the problems worse. Even if the problem goes away, they'll claim that it's not gone. I don't know, racism. I'm not saying there's no racist, but racism is not the problem government says that it is. It isn't. But God help them if they admit that. How many things exist? How much power exists within government right now under the auspice of equality? A huge shitload. You can't admit that we don't really have this problem anymore. You got to get rid of all that stuff. I'm sure you guys have all heard the analogy where there's like this, there's this airport graveyard in California, Arizona, something like that. So they get like a security guard. And so he has to watch the graveyard that, that nobody gives a shit about so that nobody breaks in and steals F-35s. Wow. Let's let that pass. That's a low ceiling those guys have, isn't it? Jeez. I'm sure you guys can hear that. I can't hear myself think. All right. So aircraft graveyard. They realize people are breaking in, living in the plane, stealing shit, spray painting stuff. They hire a security guard. And then somebody in government goes, wait a minute. Who, who's managing the security guard? So they give him a manager. Eventually, they grow this entire department of like 30 or 40 people. But the really only purpose of it is to see to the security of the airplane graveyard that they need like one security guard or maybe three to work swing shift. That's all they need. And then they have government budget cuts and who they lay off, the security guard or guards. They don't lay off any of the people that watch them. That's government. That's what we have. Anyway, let's go through some stuff real quick that I have um, marked. 
GMA Merkel says, I may not need your widget, but I can trade with someone else who does. Yeah, and that's why we have money. That's why we have money. And I do think money makes sense. But I don't think the money that we have makes sense. And I think those are two different things. Crafty Master said, would you object to banking if it was not fractional? No. I think banks serve a very valid purpose. And it is more about loans and about acting as an intermediary on a contractual basis uh, and things like that. And I also think that there is a place for if you want somebody to be in custody of your wealth, maybe you have a reason for it and a bank serve that purpose. But overall, the banking system today doesn't do any of those things. It's a self-enriching service. So I don't have a problem with banks as a whole. That's why I think fediments are the future of Bitcoin and what we like best would term is private banking services for those who need them and want them. And you would use them as you need them and you would exit them once you no longer did. And maybe you have a contract. I'm putting this much money in to some sort of going concern and I can get X amount back over X amount of time. Kind of like a CD works today, but without the fractionalization. Uh, Crafty says, I heard the best response to must be nice. It was, yes, it is. Put in the work and join me. Um, that's very much in, in league with the thing that I've tried to teach people over the years, which is if you want a great life, the first obstacle to clear out of your way is the belief that you don't deserve it. And so what you have to accept is that you deserve what you want. And a lot of people have a real adversity to hearing that because they think it's entitlement or something like, the, the, well, what about the little Gen Z person who thinks they deserve a great job in a convertible and they don't do anything? Shut up. I didn't say they deserved what they wanted, but I would tell them the same thing. You deserve what you want. The minute you say, but, and you talk about somebody else, you've avoided facing the cognitive dissonance that comes from having to realize that you are your own worst enemy. When I say you deserve what you want, it doesn't mean somebody should give it to you. Because what I finish it off with is you just haven't done the work yet. Everybody deserves anything they want as long as they do the work to get it without victimizing somebody else. And I defy you to tell me something somebody wants that they can gain without victimizing somebody else, without stealing or taking or doing harm to others. By following the uh, non-aggression principle, they don't hurt others, they don't take their stuff, and they acquired it anyway, then guess what? They deserve it. So you deserve what you want. As long as you can acquire it legitimately, you just need to get to work. Uh, John says, the uncontacted tribes have no money, but they are not impoverished. Not a lot of uncontacted tribes left. And I, I do want to dispel some beliefs about this. Uh, in doing a lot of research about biochar, for instance, I ended up learning a lot about the history of Native Americans, for instance, in South America. And there are places where there were uncontacted tribes, at least some of them members were, and they lived in these jungles. And uh, the government, of, uh, in this case, I think it was Brazil, decided that just like we did in the United States, there should be places that belong to the natives that the white man does not have any say. So they create basically effectively a reservation. Well, there's these tribes that they call Carib Indio uh, Native Americans. So they come from the Caribbean, uh, but they've, they, they emigrated to South America a long time ago, like prior to full settlement. And they exist there too. And they are a much more warrior culture. And in some of these places that were set aside for the people that were indigenous to the location, those people don't exist anymore. And it wasn't the white man that killed them. It was the other tribes, the more warlike tribe who went and killed off the peaceful tribes or those peaceful tribes are now tiny remnants that are hiding today, even still from this warrior culture. Because they had something great in Terra Preta, the other side that didn't build it wanted it. And so um, I'm not going to say that there's no poverty among uncontacted tribes, but people are able to live pretty good lives without a state. Uh, uh, the, the best example I have of real anarchy in modern times, last 150 years, is during Stalin, we all know about the gulags and the salt mines and stuff like that. But as they built the Trans-Siberian Railroad, there was also just straight up exile, which was literally they took the train as they were building the tracks out as far as it went into Siberia. 
Oh, they're still working on the tracks there. This is as far as we go. Get out. And in the first year, more than half those people died. Like, get away from the tracks. We don't want to see you. If we see you, we're going to shoot you. You're on your own. Piss off. Left to die. And as things changed, the Soviet Union fell apart, and they started sending people out. They started finding these communities in Siberia that had been cut off from society forever, and they were existing. And they had rules, and they had what you would think of as a local government, but they were really an anarchy. Because they had no outside control. The people that made the decisions all lived there. And no one made you stay. And so we definitely have places like that. Radiology, James says, radiology is being outsourced with AR. No more radiologists. I don't know if there would be no more. But a hell of a lot less. And that, I mean, if somebody told you 10 years ago, I'm going to school. What are you going to school for? Radiology. Oh, you're set. Really? Really? Pepper book, Prepper Book Club with a $5 Super Chat says, been a while since you and I, I have been here. Good to see that you're still educating, inspiring. Thank you for that. Uh, Dennis Allen, when we were talking about how we would feed society, he says he would stop food waste. How? In what way? And would you enforce it or would you incentivize it? It's, see, it's really easy, and I love Dennis, so I'm not picking on him, but it's really easy to throw out, I would do this. Until somebody asks you how and how you get that done on a broad scale. Or do you just do what we've kind of been saying? How about we eliminate food waste in our backyard and then in the backyard of our neighborhood? And then we've done enough. It's up to others to do it in their own neighborhood. Dennis also said he just sent me 500 sets. Thank you, Dennis. I'm not sure how, whether you did it on Get All B or you did it as a zap. But thank you. I always appreciate that. People also can do that on Fountain or any other podcasting 2.0 apps or something. Ace Bleeding says, and I don't, I only caught this uh, out of my my good eye and highlights. I don't know what he was following up to, but he said, based on the Bible, of course. Really? You have a right to base my rules for my life on your Bible? I don't think you do. I don't think you do. What Bible? What rules in the Bible? Old Testament rules? Am I allowed to eat shellfish? Can I have pork? Can I trim my beard? Who can I get married to? Is it okay for me to have slaves? Right? Because people are pretty selective when it comes to religion. Pretty selective when it comes to what they pick and choose out of their own religion. And theocracies have not really worked very well. So if you want to base your rules on the Bible in a community of people who voluntarily want to go there and do that, fine idea. Isn't that interesting? Something that I'm vehemently opposed to, I'm also completely okay with. Until you try to force your will on me. Well, Jack, in the Bible, there's rules like thou shalt not kill, which violates the non-aggression principle. Right? But keep holy the Sabbath day? Go ahead. Knock yourself out. Sabbath your ass off. I'm not part of your club. Why should I have to? Why should I have to close my business? Why, to this day, can a car dealership not be open on Sunday in the state of Texas? Did you know that if you don't live here? Drive by car dealerships. That's when I go look at cars, by the way. If I'm in the market for a car, I go on Sunday. They have the, the, the lots locked, but you can just walk over the fence. Park outside the lot. You can walk around, look at everything that's in inventory. And you don't have to deal with somebody going, can I put you in that new car today? Go away. Leave me alone. I'll ask for you if I need you. So I, I utilize it, but I don't think it's right. Why can't I go buy a bottle of whiskey on Sunday in Texas? You don't need it. That's your opinion. I don't think I need it either, but I think it's wrong that if you're in a liquor store, they make you close the door on Sunday. Why can I buy a six-pack of beer or a bottle of wine at the grocery store in Texas on Sunday at 12.01 p.m., but not 11.59 a.m.? How does that work? How does that work? Uh, it, by the way, it, 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 it all has roots in, in the fact that Texas is a big part of the Bible belt, at least back in the day. And these are just legacy blue laws that they won't get rid of because nobody's incentivized to. This is why I think if you're going to have a state, something the Republicans have proposed, which is totally virtue signaling and biting them in the ass, because it's being used to accuse the Republicans of trying to get rid of Social Security. 
which is not what it would be at all. But there's this idea in the Republican Party right now that every law that the federal government passes anyway should have like a 20 year sunset date. You pass a law. If you don't repass it within 20 years and reissue it, it goes away. I don't think they'll do it. I think it would be completely abused. I don't think they would follow their own rules if they did so. But I love the idea. Every law should sunset. Every law should sunset. Well, we need it. Then you would pass it again. Then we would actually have to have a debate about it. Again, it's not perfect, but it is better. Um, Space Girl says, ha, ha, ha. Our small communities have garbage collection areas and we drop off the bags of trash. Okay, but where does it go? What is done with it? Does it just go to the county landfill? And do you feel like it's a local solution or is there really a local solution? Just a thought. Uh, Thomas says property rights would be prob problematic. Who would control property ownership and why would they have a right to regulate my property if I didn't want to participate? I think that you just hit it on the head, Tom. I do. They wouldn't. Unless... When you acquired that property, you were doing it within the confines of a community that was preset with a charter that set those rules. Let's think about the organization that I think, the type of organization I think is Satan. The worst thing that happened to modern society um, when it comes to property rights in modern times, other than eminent domain, which is the state's domain, HOAs or POAs, property owners, homeowners, all that shit. I think they are the devil. I think they are Satan incarnate. I don't think they should exist. I think they are not fit to exist. But the reason I think they're not fit to exist, to be clear, I have a piece of property. That piece of property is subject to federal regulation, state regulation, county regulation, and usually city or town council regulation. I already have four or five layers of regulation and governance over my property. HOAs, therefore, in this current society are for people that are like, you know what? Just don't have enough government in my life. I want more government. I need to be regulated harder. Spank me harder, daddy. That's what an HOA is in society right now. In the society we're talking about. That's not what an HOA would be. An HOA would literally be regional self-governance. And I think that structure exists, and that's how this would exist in a society like that. But I don't claim to have all the answers. It's a reasonable question to ask. I just don't know... Um, Ah, K Box asking something totally different. He says the wood pitchforks that you posted. Where are they from? Spain. That's just, I, I'll, I'll see if I can remember to get that link. That's if you're on Noster, you got to see it. I think I found it on Twitter, but I don't think I posted it there. I'm not really doing much on Twitter anymore. But this this dude he makes pitchforks out of hackberry trees, and they're all one piece. It takes six years to train the branch from a compass. To the form that you're looking for as a base form. And then there, it's it's amazing. I'll see if I can remember to post that link in the show notes. But with that, let's go ahead and wrap up. Let me remind you guys you can help support this show by doing your online shopping at tspaz.com. That is T-S-P-A-Z, tspaz.com. Today's item of the day is one that I have been recommending for a long, long time. Before T-SPAZ, before I even got paid for it, I recommended this thing. The UTG Ranger Field Bag. You can put a small person in this throw them on your back and carry them down the road. Uh, it is a great bag. I use it a lot for airline luggage because I find even with it stuff full and being pretty heavy, I can move through an airport a lot easier with this thing on my back than dragging a roller board, especially at an airport where, you know, the rental cars aren't right there. I got to go through some kind of like shuttle bus hell to get to my rental car. It leaves my hands free. I also have used it at trade shows. I've carried 150 pounds of t-shirts in one of these bags and it was even paying the overage fee to the airline it was cheaper than mailing them to a location where i had to sell them and i was able to bring back the ones we didn't sell i think it's a fantastic bag uh when i was down at the um airsoft place uh which is where i take i have a co2 uh canister a five pound canister that i have filled up for a um a keezer, basically a draft beer system that runs out of a deep freezer. I took that down there one time and I saw a kid with this bag. And I was talking to the guy that was filling up my canister for me. I'm like, I have that same bag. He goes, oh, they all use that. It is the number one bag used by airsoft players, apparently, because it's rugged and big. This is great. It's a great bag. It's not expensive. 
It is not indestructible. I did break one. Uh, probably more accurately, baggage handlers broke it, weighed down heavily, the little feet on the bottom. But I bought another one. I've used this bag for about 15 years, and I'm on my second one. Uh, and if you don't throw 150 pounds of T-shirts in, it'll probably last you a lifetime. Uh, just a fantastic bag, kind of built around a USGI uh, duffel in a way, but I think it's actually a better tool. Definitely worth checking out. Remember, anything and everything at tspaz.com that's reviewed, I own it, bought it, spent my money on it, or I wouldn't ask you to spend your money on it. With that, I am going to wrap up. Remember, though, you can shop at tspaz no matter what you buy, help us out, even if it's not something I recommend. Also, consider joining the Member Support Brigade. If you do that, you help support the show and the work that we do. With that, guys, take care. I will catch you tomorrow. Uh, with one more interview before I'm gone for the week. We will still have uh, Expert Council Show Friday, Rewind on Thursday.